All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the 17th uh, Macro Finance Workshop. This is the second time uh, the Macro Finance Society is holding a virtual uh, workshop. And welcome, the next to the time we will have a virtual workshop will be uh, in the next fall, uh, October 22nd. It will be uh, organized by Laura Feldkamp, who has been uh, a board member since uh, last year, since before the pandemic, and joined by Hoi Chen and Venki Vekicheshwan uh, as co-organizers. Um, for me, this is my last uh, MFS workshop as president. I'm um, stepping down uh, this summer from uh, from the board altogether. Um, Alexi Salov, who is here, will be replacing me on the board. We also have Francisco Gomez, who has effectively replaced Dimitris Papanikolaou on the board as of uh, this spring, and um, Giorgio Piacentino has also agreed to join the board uh, at the end of this year when we'll have the next rotation with Mike Chernoff stepping down. Uh, so this is like a little bit of MFS business, uh, and let's get to the actual uh, business of the workshop. Uh, so uh, Tim Landvoid and Winston Du uh, have, been, have been helping me putting together uh, this, uh, this workshop today, uh, and, uh, and Nina Karnauk is also helping us with uh, our media uh, media presence. Uh, Tim will be chairing the session uh, today. So Tim, uh, the floor is yours to announce our presenters and, and the time split and so on. And thanks you all for being here. Great to see you all. Great, thank you, Nick. All right, so um, yeah, let's, uh, let's get started with the first session. Um, so the first paper is Prudential Policy with Distorted Relief. And the presenter is um, Eduardo Davila. Um, and um, the, the time split is 20 minutes for presentations, then 20 minutes for discussion, and then 20 minutes Q&A. And I see Eduardo has the slides up here and seems to be working. So um, Eduardo, you've got 20 minutes and Ready to go. Um, thanks, team. Uh, thanks to Nick and Winston of Three for, for putting the paper in, in the program. This is joint work with uh, Answer Walter from, from Imperial. So no, I only have 20 minutes, so let me just get to the point. Um, and, you know, we, we see, you know, booms and busts in financial markets, and this has, uh, you know, um, uh, opened the question to think about efficiency and efficiency in, in, in these environments. And as of today, there's a fair amount of normative work thinking about uh, these issues. And a lot of this explores market failures, and you know, there's a lot of work in which uh, we think about uh, how investors may not fully internalize their decisions, perhaps through bailouts, pecuniary externalities, or demand slams. So there are different rationales for thinking about policy. And a lot of this often called macroprudential policy is focused on regulating leverage. Now, what we're going to be doing in the paper is something a little bit different. We're going to be thinking about what is the optimal leverage regulation uh, when investors and traders have distorted beliefs relative to the plan. So there's been a lot of positive work on the role of, of, of beliefs shaping business cycles and financial cycles, but there's not that much normative work. And that's what this paper is going to do. So what are we doing, what I'm going to be showing you today? In our model, we're going to have a, you'll see a very stylized model of risk investment, finance with debt and equity, and both the, the equity investors and the, the creditors are going to have different beliefs. So that's going to be the positive part of, of the economy. Now, our main results will come on the normative side. And we're going to be thinking about leverage regulation by a planner if beliefs are the different from investors and or traders. Okay, so on the method side, I'm going to show you how we introduce some new techniques, some new form of variational derivatives to think about these general comparative statics or arbitrary changes in beliefs. And we're not allowed to make very precise statements about the form of beliefs that matter. Now, uh, once we do this, we're also going to be looking at environments in which we can make unambiguous predictions. And we're going to, I'm going to show you in a second results on what we call equity exuberance, meaning when the equity holders are too optimistic, debt exuberance, when debt holders are optimistic, joint exuberance when everybody's optimistic. So our goal is going to be to understand how should policy react to these forms of exuberance. Those are going to be the form of my main results, which I'll show you in a few seconds. Again, I won't have time in 20 minutes to tell you about all the other things we do, but we also think about the role of bailouts and how they interact here. We think about monetary policy in a, in a very specific way from an investment channel. And again, we also explore uh, limits to what happens when the planner has maybe uncertain beliefs or the planner's beliefs. Uh, Change. Let me skip the literature and just jump right away through the mouth. So there are going to be two dates, date zero and date one. They're going to be investors and creditors. Okay. The technology is as follows. So if you these investors uh, want to have a unit of capital, they need to you know pay for the unit. That's K 
and they're gonna have an adjustment cost is the epsilon. And you invest into update zero and update one, you're gonna get S times K. So S is gonna be the key source of randomness, is the technology, is the returns of the technology. All right. So everybody, both investors and creators, are gonna be risk neutral. Okay, and those are their preferences. So this F is gonna be um, the the CDF that they're gonna to attach to the different states. And here we're gonna be making two key assumptions. So on the one hand, we're gonna make investors impatient relative to creators, okay? And this is just a way to get into your solutions, actually not that critical for many of the results. Uh, what is gonna be important or more important is that we're gonna allow both investors and creators to have different beliefs, different perceptions about the different states of nature. That's gonna be modeled by this F super I and F super C, and this seems to be, to be the same, but in principle, they're gonna be, they're gonna be different, all right? So on the financing side, we're going to have investors issuing debt and the face value of the debt is going to be B times K. So B is going to be the key thing I'm going to show you in my slides. It's going to be a leverage, speaking of this, a leverage ratio. That's the face value promise. And today, these investors will be able to raise some Q that depends on this leverage. All right. This is a model with limited commitment with default. So tomorrow, if the state of nature is relative, low, relative to the amount owed, it's going to be default. And the recovery rate for the, for the creators will be phi times S. And you know, otherwise it's gonna be for repayment. So just let me very briefly walk you through the constraints again of the investors. It's like so you free and we're doing they're gonna have their consumption is gonna be equal to uh, their consumption plus the amount they invest has to be equal to their endowment plus the amount they can raise from traders in the final period. They're gonna have some endowment, and here I'm already embedding the optimal default decision. All right. So, so this is the problem. Now you see the most extremely stylized in most dimensions, with the exception of beliefs. Uh, that's what we're trying to focus on. You'll see why in a second. So now. What is the planner gonna be doing here? So the planner is gonna impose a leverage cap, or you can also think about directly choosing leverage. Okay, and the way we're gonna be, I mean, our main results are gonna be in a world in which the planner is gonna use different beliefs from the investors to evaluate this utilitarian welfare. Okay, so the planner is gonna have some beliefs for the investors and some beliefs for the creators. Now, this is a flexible approach. Okay, and just to be clear, the beliefs of both investors and creators have primitives. And these beliefs are also gonna be primitive. And then given this, we're gonna be thinking about the optimal policy. So this is a flexible approach in, in, in the following sense. If you want the planner to respect agents' beliefs, you just need to make FIP equals to FI and FCP equal to FC. If you want to have a particular view of what the planner believes the perception of the state is, you can make these things equal and set it, and you can look at different combinations, which we will do, okay? But that's gonna be our normative approach. Given this, the clear definition is all going to be standard app given, given a, a leverage cap. Um, very briefly on the positive side, and um, I don't have time to walk you through the M fully, but you know, M is really the market value of a unit of investment, and you can decompose it into an equity piece and a debt piece. Something you should notice like the equity part is sort of valued by the equity holders, the debt part is valued by the debt holders, which uh, it's natural in these setups. And there are two decisions in this setup, uh, two equilibrium choices. Two equilibrium outcomes. One is leverage, and the other is investment. So leverage comes by looking at how to optimize this uh, this value, and there's going to be a condition that depends on the discount factor difference, deadway losses, and beliefs. And you know, if I had more time, I walk you through this. But just keep in mind that these are the three factors that determine leverage. Now, once you pin that down, investment is given by some. It's like a Q theory version of it. So this is the value per unit of investment. And this is, uh, this is the, the marginal cost, the, the one you can put in, in either side. Okay, so this is how leverage and investment get determined. Keep in mind that again, belief center here, belief center here, so they will matter for leverage and for investment once, uh, once you're in, in the equilibrium. All right, so what are, we doing? what are we doing here? So we are interested in understanding how the optimal policy changes or varies in response to changes in belief. So we have to do into, we need to understand two things. First, we need to understand how the equilibrium of the economy varies in response to changes in beliefs and then how again how the policy should change when these beliefs change so those are the two steps now in this setup as you saw i work in a, in a highly stylized environment but we're keeping beliefs flexible and what we want to think about clearly and you know this is an issue that happens many times you know we have beliefs what, what is the change in beliefs is the mean changing is, is the variance is, is the tail so we're going to be looking at arbitrary perturbations so what we're going to be looking at is uh at, at we're going to be looking at this variational or gato derivative. So we're gonna be saying it's like, look, imagine some of the agents that start with the distribution F. Now we're gonna perturb that distribution F in the direction G. Okay, and epsilon is gonna, we're gonna take this epsilon to zero. Okay, so we need to make sure that when we do the perturbation of the CDFs, they remain uh, a CDF and you know, we continuously differentiable 
Gs, uh, do that. We'll talk more about this in the paper, but this is sort of the idea. Let me just kind of walk you briefly in, in the picture where it's the kind of perturbation we're looking at. So again, on the horizontal axis, you have the different states. Here I'm showing this, uh, this CDF, okay? So think about the, the, uh, the thin line as the regional F and G as the perturbation, okay? So we can do is like add this up and then build a new solid line. And that's just gonna be a change in how the beliefs change. Now for now, this is gonna be arbitrary and our first set of results will, will be fully arbitrary. I'll, I'll, you'll see when I get to specialize later on. So and then you keep in mind is because we are perturbing a CDF, you know, for example, G will be local optimism, okay? Which is a little bit G negative, sorry, it's gonna be local optimism. So here you're saying, oh, uh, when G is negative, it means that you are pushing the CDF down, which means that the probability that something to the left occurs is, is uh, less likely. So stuff to the right, you're gonna become more likely. It's, it's the notion, again, it's local. That's sort of what we're gonna be doing. Now, um, so in the first part, we, what we do is, again, I, I don't have a lot of time here, but what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be uh, using this kind of perturbation, taking the epsilon to zero, and then looking at what is, again, uh, what is the impact on leverage and investment? And again, this is uh, what's called a variational derivative in, in this context. So we provide general characterizations of how investment and leverage change in equilibrium. And, and then we provide clear, uh, notions of what matters. So for example, uh, you know, as, as you may imagine, it's gonna capture notions that are similar to you, that, that, that may be natural to you, but for example, uh, you know, what happens in states in which there's no, re in which, sorry, what happens, sorry, so changes in beliefs, for example, by investors in the default states are not gonna matter because in those states they're not, they're not marginal for them and so on. So that's a lot of what we have in the paper. And again, I'm, I'm skipping uh, a lot of it here in, in the talk. Now, what, what we do next, is we say, uh, can we find types of perturbations of types of changes under which you get an ambiguous result? And actually we show that hazard rate dominance is in a sense a natural notion of uh, optimism in, in this environment. So hazard rate dominance means the following, okay? I start with some F and then I look at a perturbed one. If I, hazard rate dominance is a notion that says that um, the hazard rate of the perturbed distribution is uh, lower than, than the other one. So it's, it's a way of thinking about optimism. So if I say that you're more optimistic in hazard rate dominance, it means that you're optimistic in a, across the whole, it's, it's stochastic or you're gonna be more optimistic across the distribution. And I want you to think of it as a strengthening of first order stochastic dominance. In other words, if you become more optimistic in the first order stochastic dominance sense, okay, that's something that most, most people sort of understand. Hazard rate dominance is a little bit more than that. Okay, in, or, in other words, if you have a hazard rate dominant perturbation, that's also going to be first order stochastic dominance, but the opposite is not going to be true. The way I like to think about it is as first order stochastic dominance, no matter how you truncate the distribution. And that's something we, we explore in the papers. Now, so what we do is then we, we look at this specific case. So we're going to, what we call by equity exuberance is a world in which equity investors become more optimistic in this hazard rate sense. When we look at that exuberance, we say what happens when dead, dead, um, when these creditors become more optimistic in hazard rate sense. When we look at joint exuberance, we say what happens if both investors and creators becomes more optimistic in this hazard rate sense. So those are kind of the key results we're gonna build in the data. So these are the positive results. Uh, on the investment side, uh, exuberance again of the form and that we just described. And what I mean by any kind, I mean both exuberance by creators or investors is gonna increase investment. So it's like a clear, unique result. So either if the creators or the investors become optimistic, investment always goes up. And this is driven by the fact that the value of the firm, in a sense, goes up, either the debt or the equity piece. Now, leverage gets to different results, to opposite results. So it's the part that makes it be more subtle here. So it has equity exuberance. So if the equity investors become more optimistic, you're going to see leverage going down. If you have debt being more optimistic, you have leverage going up. Now, you may find this surprising or not. Okay. Actually, through the model, you may think, well, if the equity uh, investors become really optimistic, uh, actually, they may want to put more of their own money, so then they want to have less leverage. Okay, our direct on the direct super side, it's like if the investors of the firm that are making the choice, they see a very cheap credit supply, then they want to take a lot of leverage. So that's the way what the way the model works. Uh, you know, a lot of the prior, like in many other papers in the literature, actually have uh, any form of exuberance pushing leverage up. And you know, we have a discussion in the paper how this works. But in our setup, we this is this is a key this is a key difference. Okay, now one key result which it wasn't obvious to us when we worked on this, and uh, you know, I, I particularly like is that joint exuberance behaves the same as debt exuberance. In other words, 
if everybody becomes more optimistic at the same time, you're gonna have both investment and leverage going up. And the intuition here is the following, even though, uh, again, uh, you, you might think, well, if, uh, you know, if it's on the equity and, and the debt side, uh, both are becoming more optimistic, I just told you that they tend to push leverage in opposite ways. However, what happens like the creditors are more patient. Okay, in our model, it comes directly because of the discount factor difference. But more broadly, if you want to think that the people who are providing the lending, they're going to be more patient, they're going to carry higher weight in terms of valuations. Okay, so even though the belief changes the same, the valuation difference is going to put more weight on, on, on the debt side, and that's going to dominate in this economy, which is like one of the nice, I mean, it's a nice result we, we, we get, which clearly wasn't obvious to us um, earlier. All right. So, so far, again, the positive part, there's, a, there's been literature exploring some of these issues and you know, we relate to all of that. Um, um, now, these are where the key normative results arise, okay? So in this setup, we're looking at a, a utilitarian planner who maximizes the utility of investors and creators using the, the planners, uh, using these planners' beliefs. And then we provide uh, the following characterization, okay? So here what we're looking at is how the social welfare changes when you vary this leverage gap and there are going to be two effects. On the one hand, there's an inframarginal effect, which is out of all the units invested, uh, what is the change in, in the valuation of those uh, when you change this gap? That's the first effect. And then, because we're in a second best environment, and I didn't emphasize this a lot, but we are only in leverage and not investment, we're also going to have an incentive effect, which is to say if investment moves because I'm moving the leverage gap, this also has a separate uh, consequence in welfare. And, you know, I'm doing some advertisement for another paper, which is somewhat related to this one, but actually quite different, which we think about these issues more generally. Here, uh, you know, what I want you to take out of this equation is a, a couple of things. So first of all, if uh, the planner, the first thing you can notice, like the economy is constrained efficient here, if the planner and the agents agree. Okay, so if the M of the planner and the M of the agents are exactly the same, it's gonna be zero, and this will be zero also at the at the less fair economy, okay? and um, the, the other thing I want you to just take a look at this is that, um, um, you know, what it's, it's for this second best term, what is important is also how, sorry, how investments are react to the leverage gap. So these are the two effects. So now, well, the next thing we do in the paper is we say, how does this expression changes when we vary the beliefs? So that's really the key exercise in the paper. It's like, how does this, sometimes we call it desire to regulate, okay, uh, is going to change when the beliefs of the agents in the economy are going to be changing. All right, and again, this will translate into an optimum under some regulatory conditions that we specify in the paper. And these are the main results. I don't think I have a ton of time, so let me just spend my last few minutes uh, telling you about it. Okay, so um, what happens in an equity exuberance case? Okay, remember, equity exuberance is a world in which the equity investors become more optimistic. Well, in that case, actually, we show that it's never optimal to impose it a binding leverage cap. So you always, you in fact have too little leverage. You like to have um, you have to have more leverage in the economy. So that's the first result in on, on, on this case. Now, on the debt exuberance scale, which is a world in which creditors become more um, optimistic, we actually show that if creditors become more optimistic, it is optimal to tighten the leverage gap. That's the second key normative result. And the third one, based, I mean, building on the logic I described to you before, is that when you have a joint exuberance case, in which like the whole economy is exuberant, uh, we're going to be qualitatively thinking the same way as in a debt exuberance case. In other words, joint exuberance also calls for tighter leverage regulation. Okay, so these are the clear distinctions. Now, just to give you a bit of intuition, okay, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a bit more subtle than what I'm going to do here, but you know, in the equity exuberance case, for example, we knew from the positive results that there was, in a sense, too little leverage. Okay, so the planner really uh, wants uh, to have more leverage. So it makes sense not to tighten the cap. Now, if you recall my previous slide, this is only working through here. There are also a number of effects coming through the incentive side, and these are much more subtle. But we show that they actually work in the same direction. Okay, and again, I haven't told you enough to be, so you can understand this uh, fully, but the idea is like, you know, policy will become insensitive in, in, in these cases. Okay, so a leverage floor may be up to now. On the debt exuberance case, you have exactly the opposite. Again, the inframarginal effect is sort of the most intuitive one. You know, you say that if creators become more optimistic, there's going to be more leverage. Well, the planner wants to counteract that. And the second incentive effect is not going to um, undo it. Okay, so I'd like to spend, I just like to show you this because these are, you know, it's been a bit abstract what we've done so far, but we're trying to, you know, we came from a very practical question, which is 
how do we think about regulation in environments with historic beliefs? So we started the paper thinking about the big short in the sense that, you know, we think about all these periods of like exuberance, people are really optimistic about the state of the economy. And, you know, we say, is there a rationale to regulate there? And in our view, what we call the dead exuberance or the joint exuberance case can map and represent a period like, you know, 06, 07, 08, in which people were, you know, both lenders are very exuberant and perhaps also investors are very exuberant. And this is how we started thinking about the paper. Now, while working on this, uh, you know, when we found the equity exuberance result, we really struggled a little bit to, to map it to practice. But one case that we highlight in the draft is the Hertz bankruptcy case, which happened like you know, a bit more than a year ago. And I don't know if you recall the scenario there, but uh, there was a uh, there was a situation in which um, Hertz had declared bankruptcy, okay, the, the car rental company. And um, for some reason, investors were really bullish and really eager to, to buy equity. Okay, and they tried to make some equity, to issue new equity. In that case, the SEC, the regulator, intervened and stopped the agents from issuing equity. Okay, so that is a world, that is a case that we interpret as equity exuberance. If you have equity markets being extremely frothy, they're gonna be trying to issue too much equity. Okay, and maybe the world in which we live right now is something that is closer to an equity exuberance world as opposed to, to, to a joint exuberance or a debt exuberance world. So this is kind of the ideas we're trying to, to connect to the more to the more firm results. You know, now Hertz, maybe the story is not that good maybe because exposed, uh, you know, things have changed. But again, our papers are about what happens exposed. It's really about should we, can we rationalize the choice of the SEC of preventing uh, equity, equity from being issued? Our model definitely provides a normative rationale for doing so under under these conditions. Uh, so yeah, I don't have a lot of time to go over this, but let me just very briefly, okay, what I have here, I'm plotting. Um, this is actually normal. It's a solution of the model, and this sort of illustrates most of the results, okay? So on the horizontal axis, you have the beliefs of your investors, traders, or both, and here I have the different scenarios. So for example, on the top left plot, if you look at this, um, this light blue line, that is a dead exuberance case, okay? So here, if the beliefs of traders become more exuberant, you see leverage going up. The joint exuberance case is the next one in green. You see the same leverage going up with exuberance. And in the bottom case, is equity exuberance. So if the beliefs of investors go up, you see how leverage goes down. On the right, you see investment going up in all the scenarios. Now, I'm only gonna do the bottom left, which is what happens to the optimal regulation. Okay, so here you can see, um, um, you can see what happens, okay, in, in in the in the different cases, okay, and you see how um, in the I'm gonna let me focus in the in on the um, on the dead exuberance case. So joint exuberance is just sorry. Uh, let me just make sure I get this clear. Let me compare debt and joint exuberance. Show the two cases in which uh, this is gonna be a binding condition. The blue line represents uh, something slightly different. But here you can see how with both debt exuberance and joint exuberance, uh, when um, agents become more optimistic, you see the leverage cap going down, which means it gets tighter and tighter. Something that is interesting to us was that- you, are, sorry, Tony, you have one minute, so- Okay, perfect, thank you. I'll conclude. Um, I just wanted to highlight that even though you may think that the joint exuberance case uh, calls for a lower leverage cap, that's actually not true. And you actually have the tightening of the cap is higher in that case, and it's partly because of the fact that investment grows heavily. Okay, I don't have a lot of time to walk you through it, but I, this is something that came out of the analysis, which I actually think is quite, quite interesting. Uh, so in my last minute, let me tell you, and we explore other things in the paper, bailouts, uh, has a nonlinear impact, monetary policy, and you know, we have there's an investment channel that tends to work very well, well here. And then if you're not aware, if you don't like our welfare criteria, we also explore how it changes, okay, what happens when the price beliefs change, and, and you can see the paper through a positive lens or when the planner has some distribution of beliefs and so on. So yeah, in my last 10 seconds, again, uh, I hope I give you a, a glimpse of what we do in the paper. But again, we study optimal regulation uh, when beliefs change by both investors and traders. And there's a, you know, there are asymmetric effects of optimism on an exuberance on both you know, on the positive side, but most importantly for us, which is where we're bringing the new results on the, on, on the normative side. Okay, so just to summarize, dead exuberance or joint exuberance will call for tidal leverage caps, well, equity exuberance, which can we map this Hertz scenario, we'll call for, for having um, more leverage in the firm. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Eduardo. And the uh, discussion is Georgia Piacentino. Georgia, can you uh, share your slides? Oh, 
All right, and you also have 20 minutes and that's Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to discuss this paper. Uh, it's a new has a new interesting uh, uh, insight and follows through with an exhaustive analysis. So it was a pleasure and a bit of a challenge uh, to read them and prepare the discussion. Um, so let me uh, launch start with a, a word of motivation. So exuberant beliefs can fuel lending booms. So we need policy uh, to curb them. And the question that the uh, authors want to ask is what is the optimal policy when investors and or uh, creditors have exuberant beliefs. And the answer uh, that the authors give is that the optimal policy depends on the type of belief distortion. In particular, uh, creditor exuberance calls for a strict leverage regulation, uh, whereas perhaps surprisingly, investor exuberance calls for no leverage regulation whatsoever. And this is kind of the counterintuitive result. And the insight behind this nice result is that optimistic investors choose not to lever up. What's the intuition? Well, investors are optimistic. Uh, that means that they perceive creditors as pessimistic. So they perceive debt to be expensive. That's why they, uh, you know, they don't want to uh, lever up. They basically decrease leverage privately. So um, in my discussion, I'm going to start with an oversimplified version of the model. Uh, I, so you have to bear with me. It's going to be really only for bullet points, but I think it really goes uh, and kind of nails the, the uh, kind of what I think are the key results. And then based on this oversimplified model, I'm, I'm going to build my comments. Uh, so I promised for bullet points. Uh, so there's going to be an investor, I, that's going to be me. Uh, I issue bonds with face value uh, B and price QB uh, to the creditor who's going to be Eduardo. Um, I start with an endowment in zero, uh, but I need to uh, borrow to finance an investment that is going to cost one. So notice here, I'm really not going to focus much on investment, and this is going to be one of my main points. I don't think that this investment is a bit of a sideshow, I think, in the mob. Uh, and uh, this investment is going to pay uh, either S uh, if the investment succeeds or zero if it fails. Uh, and here I'm simplifying. As I can see, I only have two states. I don't have a continuum of states, but I think... The, the result, I'm going to deliver the results. Uh, agents are going to have subjective beliefs. So, so the probability uh, of, have, of being you know, in, in, in the success state, so the, in which the investment pays off S, is PJ for agent J. Now, if uh, uh, the uh, project pays zero, uh, then the creditor, that's Eduardo, is going to bear convex default cost, which I'm going to call Psi. So in the paper, there's linear default cost. Here, they're uh, convex because I'm gonna be, that's going to allow me to get interior solutions with only two states uh, rather than using a continuum of states. I'm going to make an assumption, um, and you'll see uh, what, what it drives, the fact that you know, the creditor has a higher discount factor than the investor. That means that the creditor is more patient. So with this, um, I'm just ready to give you the investors and the planners program. Um, here, if I invest, here investment is bang, bang. So if I choose to invest, I'm going to choose leverage, B star, uh, such that it maximizes my utility. What's my utility given by? Well, today I start with an endowment and zero. I borrow QB from Eduardo, but I have to invest one in my project. Tomorrow, what do I get? Well, I have to discount uh, the payoff by my discount factor beta i, and then uh, I'm going to, uh, the project is going to succeed with probability pi. Uh, that's my belief that the project succeeds. If it succeeds, I get s, but I have to repay b uh, the debt. Then this is subject, I maximize this utility subject to what I'm going to call the non-negative non -negative consumption constraint. And I'm going to, uh, this is going to be one of my comments, so uh, remember it, it's important. Uh, so this says that my consumption has to be positive. So that means that my endowment plus what I borrow today um, minus my investment has to be positive. And finally, uh, the creditor's uh, individual rationality constraint, the creditor here is breaking even. So what he gives me today, that's the price of the debt, has to be equal to his expect what he expects to get tomorrow, which is he discounts at rate uh, beta C. Um, and what he believes he's going to get tomorrow, well, he's going to get with probability PC, he thinks that the project is going to succeed and he's going to get uh, his face value B. But with probability 1 minus PC, uh, the project is going to fail and he's going to bear the cost psi, uh, the default cost. What is the planner's program? Well, the planner's program, uh, the planner is going to choose B of P for planner. Uh, he's solving the same program, but just subject to its own beliefs. That's it. Now here, by looking at the investor's program and just plugging in QB 
into the utility here, it's going to give me the key trade-off uh, of the model, so which is the key leverage trade-off, which is given the, by the marginal value of leverage. So if you just differentiate the utility, my utility with respect to leverage, you get a marginal benefit of leverage versus a marginal cost. Well, what's the marginal benefit? Well, the marginal benefit that you can see here, it's just the valuation difference between the agent, which is due to the different optimism and patient. So look at it. So when is there a benefit of of leverage well when the creditor is either more patient so that means his discount factor is larger beta or he's more optimistic that's when p is larger when these two things are happening relative to my patient and optimism well then that is going to be cheap i'm going to perceive that to be cheap okay and that's the benefit the problem of the cost here is that of course uh, uh, there's a cost of default and that's going to be what's driving uh, you know what why i may choose not to you know uh, increase leverage uh, to infinity Okay, great. So now, if the non-negativity constraint uh, is like that I told you in the previous slide is lack, well, then the optimal leverage is just going to be given by setting this uh, um, derivative to zero, which is, I'm going to choose the leverage such that the marginal benefit is equal to the marginal cost. With this, I'm ready to give you the, what I think are the two main economic results of the paper. Uh, the first result is the effect of optimism on leverage, which is the author's proposition three exactly. So let me uh, tell you what it says. It says the equity exuberance, uh, which is defined as an increase of investor optimism, is going to lead to lower leverage. You can just see this by differentiating the optimal leverage by the beliefs of the investor, and you can see it's negative. What is the intu economic intuition? Well. Here, the investor is optimistic. That means that he, the investor, so that's me, I, I perceive that to be expensive as the creditor, Eduardo, is relatively more pessimistic. So I perceive that to be expensive, so I choose not to borrow, but I want to still invest. How, I'm going to, how am I going to invest? How am I going to finance that investment? Well, I'm just going to reduce consumption. Why? Well, remember the key thing that here, I'm assuming that the um, consumption constraint is lack. Okay, so I can reduce that consumption to finance that investment. The debt exuberance case is a case in which the creditor is relatively optimistic relative to an investor. That means that that's going to lead to higher leverage. The optimal leverage is increasing in creditor optimism. What's the intuition? Well, here that is cheaper as the creditor is relatively more optimistic, it's basically mispricing the debt if you want. So I really want to borrow. I'm going to borrow and that's going to increase my consumption. Finally, the joint exuberance case is just basically the debt exuberance case. The joint exuberance case is a case in which both the creditor and the investor are optimistic, but they have the same beliefs, which I'm going to call P. This is also going to lead to higher leverage. What is the intuition? So they're both optimistic. So you might think they're, and they have the same beliefs. So you might think that it's just a horse race between equity exuberance and debt exuberance, but actually it isn't. Why? Because remember that the creditor is more patient. So that means that the creditor's belief are going to matter more as he cares more about the future. Basically, there is a higher weight on the debt exuberance case. There is a higher weight on, on the beliefs of, of the debt. And that's why the results are basically all the debt exuberance results. The second main result is about optimal regulation, which is proposition six, which says what? Well, it says, well, in the equity exuberance case, it's defined here slightly differently. I'm sorry for that, but it's that the investor uh, beliefs are is more optimistic relative to the creditor and the planner. In this case, you do not want to cap leverage. And in fact, it's easy to show that the optimal, uh, privately optimal leverage is lower than the planner's optimal leverage. What is the intuition? Well, again, the investor here is perceiving that to be costlier than it is. So I do not want to borrow. So I do not, I, I, I just consume too little. So there's no point in, in capping leverage here. I'm not borrowing, I'm borrowing too little. The debt exuberance case is a case in which the creditor is more optimistic than the investor and the planner. Here, you want to cap leverage. Indeed, the private optimal leverage is greater than the planner's optimal leverage. Why? Well, again, the creditor perceives that to be safer uh, than it is. So I really want to borrow and I end up consuming too much. So we want to uh, cap that. The joint exuberance is just the same as the debt exuberance but for the intuition that I told you before. OK, so these are the um, main results. And now I'm ready to give you uh, my comments, starting with the first comment, which is what constraint binds. So I've given you all of the results that are in Eduardo Emansker's paper, uh, with, um, which are given for, this, for the non-negativity constraint to be slack. That means that they are how, if it's a household, the household consume, or if a firm, the firm is paying dividends. In this case, when the investor is optimistic, 
um, I perceive the investor, I perceive the debt to be very expensive because I'm more optimistic relative to the creditor. Uh, so I don't want to borrow and there's no need for a leverage cap. And that's the counterintuitive result in Eduardo's paper. Now, the question though is what if the constraint binds? Well, if the constraint binds, I, uh, I can't finance my investment with consumption, but I'm optimistic. So I really want to invest. So then what I, even if that is expensive, I have to end up levering up to invest. And in this case, I would need a leverage cap to mitigate the overinvestment. So opposite to uh, kind of uh, what Eduardo and Ansgars have shown. So the concern here is that if this constraint binds, we flip the main result, which is that you need the leverage cap with executive exuberance. And in fact, indeed, the authors do show this in the appendix. They're aware of this. But I think this matters. And it matters because when uh, investors are very optimistic, they do because they are really optimistic. They really value that investment. So they want to scale up. So the constraint, this negative consumption constraint is, end up, is going to end up binding. So in other words, with equity exuberance is likely that we are in the flipped result case. So it's likely that we are in the vanilla case in which uh, you, know, you want to cap leverage with exuberant beliefs. Okay, so I think that here the author should think about how the beliefs are affecting uh, this uh, uh, non-negativity constraint. Now, to my second comment, uh, I need to talk a little bit more about investment, because I shut off investment in my oversimplified version of the model, um, but I, I want to talk to uh, about you a bit more about it. So in the oversimplified version of the model, there is no investment, but I think it delivers the main economic results, uh, and I'm going to get back to this. Now, in my oversimplified model, the space of belief changes I can look at, of course, is smaller. I only have these two states. But the direction for which the author get the economic result, so the hazard rate dominance are so coarse, they basically resemble the binary case. And that's why I was able to get all of the results with the binary case. But OK, but the authors do have other results. Um, but I'm able to generate all of the results. And in fact, I'm not going to show you, Eduardo, they're all, I've shown you everything is going to be in the appendix of the slide. But I can generate them all by just adding to my oversimplified model, I can just add scalable investment in K with adjustment uh, cost Upsilon. But I would still argue that my model is still simpler than yours. Why? Because I still have two states. So I don't need, you know, I have no need for calculus of variation. I can do everything with, the, um, with the, you know, standard calculus. And perhaps the only thing I cannot match perfectly is proposition two, but everything else I can. And uh, I still have convex default costs, whereas you have linear default cost. But this is just a way to, for me to get interior solution rather than having a continuum of states. But most importantly, I'm able to deliver uh, in this new model uh, a result that the authors care about, which is what they call the incentive effect, which says that loosening the cap, the leverage cap, B bar, increases optimal investment K star. Now, of course, the authors show this uh, uh, with using some derivatives, but what I want to ask, why is this the case economically? So to do that, I have to write down the program with investment. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically write it down in my oversimplified version of the model, but I'm going to write the program in terms of total debt B, rather than writing it down with debt per unit capital little b, which is what the authors do, which is basically they're writing down in terms of little b, which is big B, total debt over, the, uh, over investment. Now, the investor's program is going to, now, instead of uh, choosing only leverage, it's going to have, I will have to choose both total debt P star and the optimal uh, investment to maximize my utility. This should look familiar, but I've changed it. I had to add investment K, uh, I had to add the adjustment cost K, and there's going to be a K here that appears uh, uh, as well uh, in, in, in the payoff of the project. Uh, the participation constraint of the creditor is the same, but now I have an additional constraint, which is the leverage constraint that says the total debt is less than um, um, basically the leverage caps times K. And this is the same leverage constraint that Eduardo has. Now the incentive effect result says that higher, the higher is the leverage cap, the higher uh, is uh, the optimal leverage. But this is coming only through this constraint. So stare at this constraint, why is this result there? Well, if this constraint binds, so if the leverage constraint binds, and if you increase uh, uh, B, hat, B bar, sorry, uh, then you can see that when it binds, uh, B, the total debt, becomes way more sensitive to K. So that means that the investment, so if I want to increase debt, uh, whenever B bar uh, is large, K becomes, an increase in K becomes more valuable. And that's why I want to increase optimal investment. 
But note here, and this is important, that everything of the investment, the interaction between leverage uh, and investment is only coming through this constraint. Uh, so in fact, absent the leverage constraint, total debt and, and optimal investment would be entirely, would decouple entirely. And this leads to my second comment, which is, is investment a sideshow? So total debt and B star and K star, which is optimal investment, interact only via the constraint, at least in my simplified model, but I think I haven't checked, but I think also in the author's model. So this implies that if a cap is on total debt, not on debt over capital, okay, as the authors have, then investment would not depend on the cap whatsoever. It would not depend on, on the leverage cap. So that would mean that investment would be independent of regulation. And this is why I'm saying that perhaps investment is a sideshow. As I said, in my oversimplified model that I showed you, I didn't basically have, in the, I mean, I had investment, but nothing was driven by investment. So the question is, does the policy affect investment only due to the form of the constraint? And the concern here is that the form of the constraint is not theoretically motivated, it's just an ad hoc constraint that takes the form. And I'm not entirely sure how realistic it is. Um, in, in practice, in fact, leverage caps are on book leverage or market leverage. And in the paper, um, the leverage cap doesn't include, uh, it's not on book leverage, I think because it doesn't include historical costs, so it doesn't include adjustment costs, and it doesn't include the endowment, so it doesn't include book value of, uh, of equity. And it's also not on market leverage because it's not about market value of equity or, or the endowment. And I think this matters uh, because um, it answers the question of whether the relevant inefficiency is the full cost or its overinvestment. And in fact, in the version that I gave you in the oversimplified model at the beginning, all the inefficiency were only about the full cost. There was nothing about basically overinvesting and underinvesting. And I really think that, uh, I, I think, you know, it took me a while to kind of try to understand and disentangle these two things. And I think having investment there, if investment is, it, is just a sideshow, then it obfuscates the results. Um, this leads, leads me to the third comment, which is about private solution. If indeed the main inefficiency is the fall cost, then this can be avoided privately by a contingent contract. Just think about equity. Now, the authors do allow for equity issuance in the appendix, and they say that the results go through, but they are not allowing equity issuance to the patient agents. And so I think that the fact that the results go, go through is kind of a foregone conclusion. Um, I, it's as if I'm issuing equity only to myself, and I'm not allowing issuing equity to Eduardo. So the question is, in the inter interpretation of what's the interpretation of policy when agents can optimize privately, the concern here is that agents can circumvent the inefficiency on their own. And I think this matters uh, because the policy would be moot uh, if agents can just find private solutions. Finally, uh, to my fourth comment, which is what does um, the model apply to? So here, uh, the investors uh, borrow, or borrow only uh, with only debt uh, to finance investment uh, um, and uh, uh, to pay a dividend. Now the question is, who are these investors? So I think this would just help, like kind of really, kind of tell a, a story. So I don't really think it, these in, uh, investors are bank or large firms. And the reason I say this is that large, banks or large firms issue equity and debt to the same agents. In other words, there is not this segmentation that you have in the market between equity and debt. Um, you know, if I think I, I hold both deposits in my bank and I hold the equity through of the bank through uh, the retirement account. So I don't think that this segmentation is there for banks or large firms. I don't really think that these are small firms either because I don't think, I think that in small firms are investing all the capital. In other words, they're not paying dividend. I don't think they have a slack consumption, non-negative consumption constraint. And finally, I'm not sure it's about households either, because I think bar households are basically borrowing mainly to consume and not to finance an investment. Although, if instead we think that investment, if you, you know, is a sideshow, perhaps it is a model of household, but then I would encourage getting rid of investment more, more or less. Um, and I think this matters because uh, we need to know um, where uh, these policy uh, prescriptions apply. And I think it's a kind of uh, to tell a story. So to make me conclude, I think it's an interesting paper, which is built on a new compelling insight, uh, which is this idea that, uh, you know, uh, investors are optimistic. Um, that means that they perceive creditors are pessimistic because they perceive creditors are pessimistic. They perceive that to be expensive. And that's why uh, they, want to not, they want to decrease leverage privately. I had basically four comments. The first comment is what if the investor is so exuberant um, or exuberant enough uh, to invest to capacity? In this case, we would 
I worry that we would go back to the plain vanilla case in which you do want to um, cap leverage when, uh, when investors are exuberant. The second is what is the role of investment? Is investment just a sideshow? And does the role of investment only come through the leverage constraint? The third question is what if agents can optimize privately? Then you know, do we need policies? The policy point moot. And finally, who are these investors? I do think that perhaps if we don't focus too much on investment, this uh, could be household, but I think uh, I would like to hear what you say. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Georgia. Um, so now we have 10 minutes for um, Q&A and we're following the uh, NBRAP rule. So the presenter is not supposed to directly respond to the discussion and that people can just ask questions. Um, and you know, if, if you want Eduardo to respond to um, to one of Georgia's comments, then you can kind of repeat her question. Um, so I'll open it up to questions. And I guess uh, you can either type it in the chat or um, you know, un unmute yourself and ask a question. Hey, this is uh, Will Diamond here with a question. Uh, Eduardo, I'm wondering if you change the first period so that there's curvature of the utility function instead of being just constant and linear, you might be able to get George's case where things are binding uh, and your case that are not binding with a sort of smooth region in between to capture this intuition that one reason why you might lever up is to get more exposure to the asset without having to put up as much capital so you can consume today. Um, thanks, Will. Yeah, well, I mean, that case, it's section 8.5 in the appendix has the bind. We, we don't even need that. Like, it, it may, it depends on parameters, it may bind or it may not bind. We have it in the paper. Just to clarify a bit, like, we're not there. It's not just like, you know, the equity stuff is a bit more exotic in a sense, but we also think, I mean, the other are also new in, in the following sense, like thinking about the leverage gap, thinking about in this setup. That's not something that had been discussed in this setup. So I am perfectly fine. It becomes an empirical question whether do you see and it has very clear empirical questions do you see equity being issued then you're probably in our world do you see equity not being issued then you're probably in a binding constrained world so i to me it's all parts of the model we emphasize its results partly because you have to you know put them all in one way but i don't see as this is contradictory they are both part of the model they're both analyzed one is in the body the other part is in the appendix that's that's uh, uh yeah that's what we have Thanks, Will. I'd like to hear you uh, respond to George's uh, point that uh, maybe investment is a sideshow here. I'd, I'd like of, to hear some back and forth. Of course. Uh, um, thanks, Laura. Yeah, so, OK. Uh, it is, I'm sorry to say, but it's not true. It is leverage in the moment is determined independently from investment. But investment does depend on leverage. So they're not fully decoupled. Uh, there are two things that are important. So investment is something that you know regulators really care a lot about real effects, and that is part of the reason to us have investment in the model, and it's what we call in the paper these uh, incentive effects. Now we could sort of nothing prevents us from fixing leverage, like fix K, and then redo the analysis. And again, it's really a special case of what we have. It makes the analysis much less nuanced. But something that is important, and uh, it's like in practice, regulations don't tend. To to focus on leverage on ratios and then to focus on scale and we explained the paper that that's one of the so these are the two reasons first real effects are important investment is important uh, it's not decoupled in in our model second um uh, again it is important to think about this 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 second round of the policy on the point of like you know one no, thing also in george's discussion is like i'm very happy with simple models but again like this since laura asked me you know People like that will appreciate the role of like tails of regions of distributions, you know? And, you know, one point that is, if one starts thinking about beliefs, one realizes how hard it is to make precise claims about what a change in beliefs uh, are. And yeah, we can put two states, but actually the world's much more complex. So these methods that, that we bring in, they're really allowing us to think about this in a, in a rich way. And what we call optimism is not something ad hoc. It is like the mall is telling us has a rate dominance is the rate of optimism that makes an ambiguous prediction. So the sort of, but again, I'm, I'm taking the liberty to, to expand in the question, but I hope my answer makes sense. So these are the, the two reasons. First, again, investment is important, something we think about. Second, investment is usually not regulated, but something that's not respond to the policy. And we really think that having both is, um, is important. We like to think about the real dimension. 
So can I just clarify one thing? I, I, I just maybe you, you missed it. I'm just saying that the only way that you have investment in your model is the interaction is coming through the leverage constraint. Uh, so that you have a different form of leverage constraint than investment is a sideshow. I just want to clarify that I didn't say that you didn't have investment in your model. It's just that the only way it's coming through is through the leverage constraint. So if you have a different shape of a leverage constraint, uh, then you wouldn't have. And I, I just don't think that's true, Georgia. We can talk more about it. Uh, I mean, in the equations that I show you, again, anything that changes the market value of the firm will change um, investment. So any form of constraint that changes the market value is a Q theory. So anything that changes the Q will have to change investment. So that, that is my claim. So I, hi, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Guillermo, go ahead. So uh, it, I, I really enjoyed the, the presentation, Eduardo, and a great discussion, Georgia. Uh, th thanks so much. Uh, I have a question about reinterpretation. I would like you to comment on that. So my, my presumption is always like investors are pretty certain about the investments, probabilities of success, while creditors are not. So is it fair to think on what you call investor exuberance as creditors dullness or apathy or whatever is the antonym of exuberance that I, I, I'm not good at, at English, but imagine that that's what, what you have. Creditors are just missing on the other side. Would you recover your results? Is, is the same thing? Mm. You know, that's a good point, Guillermo. So a lot of what we do, especially when we look at the, the hazard rate results, it's really about, you're thinking dullness and certainty is more about second moments. And what we have, these hazard rate conditions are more about, it's not really first moments, but it's about like this, like pushing the distribution all in the same direction. So again, the results, again, the general case will encompass some uncertainty, but it's not sort of quite what we're looking at now. Um, I mean, the results work both ways, like towards optimism and pessimism, but we're really mostly thinking about a directional effect. I, I hope my answer makes sense. I think- my, my, my question, I guess, is that it seems that everything is driven by the relative perception between investors and credit. It is, yes. It's, so it's, in a way, my, my intuition comes from if you're fixing the credit to investors always in the right position, it's just how creditors differ on one, differ on one side or the other, that, that's why. This is true with a caveat that, um, you know, for investors to be investors and creators to be creators, they, they have to be sort of in the right set of, uh, they have to be the right set of conditions. So in the paper, we discussed a little bit about these things. And again, as long as you're in the same space, that's okay. If you have these very big changes, then maybe you kind of move away. So that, that's the short answer. And I think it's something we could explore further. I, I know we're close to kind of out of time, but I wanted to follow up on that and as well as George's question about who are, who are the investors. And that's always kind of puzzled me given the, you know, the bigger workload evidence, right? That when mm -hmm. there's a second debt issuance, subsequently debt seems to underperform. So it's like the times when there's a lot of debt issuance, that's when debt investors just somehow are over exuberant. And then when there's spike in equity issuance, that's when equity investors are over exuberant and equity underperforms. But, but as George said, well, in principle, investors can buy both debt and equity. So why, do, why, why is it necessarily that segmentation in the market is sort of in the clientele, I guess, of the debt and equity go together with the kind of heterogeneity and beliefs? And can we, can we think of a more, sort of what, what happens in a more general world where investors have differences in beliefs and then they can se segment themselves into whether they want to buy equity or, or debt based on what, what their beliefs are relative to the others. And then what happens in that world is not obvious, is not obvious to me. Who is going to buy what? Because you have to put this constraint, right? That mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. that these mm -hmm. like say the pessimistic creditors cannot buy cannot buy equity. What happens when they when when they can? And does does that undo anything? This is an awesome point. And I'm I'm you know we discussed this very briefly in the paper. Um, so Different answers. The first answer is it is true we're putting this, this exogenous, uh, we make this exogenous. My personal way of thinking is the following. I think that many times who is an investor and who is a creator, and again, we can, I'll talk a bit more about different scenarios, is something that depends on other things. And then in our model, the difference in this kind of function that the way losses pushes one agent to be on the one side and the other. And around this point, beliefs sort of matter at the margin. Now, a lot of the literature has taken a different path. If you read some of the other work, like Jenna Kalpas and whatever, a lot of that literature builds, puts the beliefs at the forefront of who is who in the economy. My personal view is that, the, and that's why I sort of like to do it this way, is to say, hey, you know, I'm, 
I'm young, I'm buying a house, I'm gonna be a borrower because I need to borrow. And then my optimism will change at the margin of my decision. For a firm, it might be the same. You may have different life cycles and then the beliefs change your perception. That's the way I like to think about it. So in that world, I see my results like, you know, there are many forces that shape where you are, but I wanna think about it changing beliefs in different ways. So that's one way of doing it. More technically, we can, and I guess maybe we can put in the paper, there are conditions under which I can tell you who is gonna be who. So I can do the sorting in my mode, but again, I'm, I'm not so, I don't find it that appealing for the reason that I give you. Now, closer bit to George's point, you know, I give you the, the hurts and, 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 and big short example because that's the way I like to think about it. I know the model is a little bit abstract, but I think the forces are sort of apply. We wanted to look at it in a case by case basis. I think that the hertz case is a very nice case. And I love you bring Bay from Burglar. We cite all that literature because a lot of this macro potential work tends to be like leverage and, and, in, and all these things, right? But there's also all these literature thinking about people using a ton of equity in the market and this have, so we cite all that body of work, you know, behavioral corporate finance, which we think provides many different cases in which you see one or the other. And again, we don't give a clear answer of what is what, that's more of an empirical question. But I think, uh, you know, arm with them all, one can start to think on a case by case basis, how to use it. What the SEC did with Hertz, I think if it's 100%, it's exactly, you know, they could have said, hey, based on this model, that's gonna be our, our that's how we're gonna make the decision. Again, that case, the case in which like, um, and just to be clear, in the mall, as George said, we have equity investors and outside investors. So it's not necessarily that the, you could issue equity. The assumption is that the beliefs that we call equity investors are the beliefs of those people you issue equity to, or it could be an average between the inside equity and the outside equity. So those are the, that's how the way you reinterpret the results. But again, I think that case really maps to what we have. And then for the loose credit conditions, there's so many papers and there's so much literature thinking about it that I, I think there's not much to, to motivate. You could see about firms. And again, of course, the model is all risk neutral and so on. So house is not the, the, the base. It's not, it's, that's how a one-to-one -one mapping. You can see how the forces um, may apply um, directly. Just one last thing also since, just to be clear, the default costs, we could take the default costs away and everything, and we put conditions on beliefs, everything goes through. The only rationale for intervention here are the beliefs, okay? So they can, even when there are default costs, the economy will be constrained, efficient. There's nothing this, this, uh, these people can do. Again, subject, of course, to this to the assumption on who is who. But again, all the rationale, everything we've done is being coming from this, if you want to call it paternalistic objective that the planet has. Right. Well, uh, thanks a lot for uh, the great questions. And um, I think we should cut off the Q&A here because that leaves us only with a uh, four minute break to the next paper. Um, so um, I'll see everybody back here in four minutes.